hey, we're here. And hey, I'm, Donna. I'm here with Stephen Biggs. So I'm going to get more in the picture, and I'm going to do it that way. How's, How's that? that? Good. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome back to Facebook Live. I'm Donna Balzer. And this week, the exciting thing is I am with Stephen Biggs. And if you don't recognize Stephen, he is the co-author. Look at that. Stephen, yeah, Stephen, yeah, you look exactly the, the same. Uh -huh. Stephen's here with me today, and we are going to be answering your vegetable questions. And just a little bit of housekeeping. If you're new to Facebook, you just go over to the right-hand side and you'll see where it says, well, I think it's, you can ask answer questions or you can ask us questions because we're here. We're the vegetable mm -hmm. people and we are wanting to make vegetable growing easy for you and we're going to do it here today. So I am Donna. If you don't remember, I am the author of the Three-Year Gardener's Gratitude Journal, which is new this year, as well as the no golf vegetable gardening. So ask us your garden mm -hmm. questions. But first, I'm going to let Steve introduce himself a bit more. Sure. And I am Steve, and I co authored No Golf Vegetable Gardening with Donna. And I'm a writer and speaker, and my focus is farm, food, and gardening. I love it. What's your webpage? Mm -hmm. My webpage is stevenbiggs.ca, S T E V E N B I G G S.ca. Excellent. So we can get your questions going now if you've got them and if not steve and i will just talk among ourselves because i know steve who lives and grows and gardens in toronto has been doing some really interesting things this year what have you been up to mm -hmm. steve well the big thing this year is that my daughter emma who's 13 has really taken over a lot of the garden so i've actually stepped back and given her a lot of space so i'm wow. actually feeling a little bit out of control in my in my <laughs> vegetable garden because she's got 130 tomato varieties in there wow. she has loads of di she loves the unusually colored stuff so carrots every color of the rainbow and then things that are a bit different so we have a chosha which is a little pod like uh cucumber like pod crunchy pod and um Oh, we've got the Mexican sour gherkins that we always have and um, weird colored eggplants. So lots of mix, lots of color. And she's going for the unusual, strange, new colors, that sort of thing. You know what's just reminding me? We should have picked some of those unusual tomatoes and brought them here today. Mm -hmm. But we didn't mm -hmm. do that. I actually just love the um, sunrise. Ah. You know, the sunrise sunrise bumblebee is bumblebee. Emma's favorite. Oh, yeah, is she that... gave those seeds to me this spring, and I love mm -hmm. that one. And I was just showing them the. I think I was just showing them to Keith today. Right. They are beautiful, but mm -hmm. I didn't bring any down to show. And you. and there's more than one, I believe, with sunrise in the name. There's yes. a, there's a whole series. Yeah, of, last year I did the blackberry, but she said if you haven't tried the sunrise, you're just gonna love it. And it's striped. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Sean Marie is here. Thanks, Sean Marie. You are also a big tomato grower, I think. And just a few days ago, I, Sean Marie, Sean actually we call her, is from Red Deer. Mm -hmm. And she has a big greenhouse as well. So she grows oh, quite a bit okay. in her greenhouse. And I just posted all the photos on my Facebook page of the tomatoes I grow. Do you know that if Emma will be posting her tomatoes, a picture of them all? Yeah, she has a blog on stephenbiggs.ca, and okay. she blogs. She's like me. She's irregular. When yeah. the gardening season's done, she'll throw up a few posts. So okay. she will put up pictures. And, and last fall, she had a tomato tasting event. So oh, we had, she put up a picture of this whole big dining room table covered with all of these different tomatoes, different sizes, colors. So Nice. So she actually really gets into it. Loves it. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Well, we are here talking about what's happening in our vegetable garden. And I know right now I'm at the point where I'm taking out a lot of my things. For instance, I'm removing my tomatoes. I mean, they're in my greenhouse, so they could last mm -hmm. for a while longer. But I'm removing those. I'm just starting to put things in the freezer. I'm also digging quite a few potatoes. Now, if you're growing potatoes and they haven't died back, you can leave them. But if they finish blooming and they're starting to die back, you can start taking them out. You don't have to leave them. Frankly, I just leave them until I need them. But later this fall, people will be digging their potatoes, but no rush. People think there's a day and they have to do it by that certain day, but not so. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to talk about today. Have you got anything happening in your garden that's new for well, you this year? Yeah, so new this year is that, and uh, and I've gardened on uh, paved surfaces before, Donna, mm -hmm. but um, 
this year we ran out of vegetable garden space because as I mentioned, Emma is so keen. Mm -hmm. So we looked at our big long driveway and we said, hmm, how can we garden there? So we've done the straw bale garden approach. Okay. And we put in probably about a dozen bales in the spring and we worked them for three, four weeks with uh, blood meal, high nitrogen, mm -hmm. to get those bales primed, mm -hmm. get that microbial activity going. And, uh, and then after the temperature goes through a little spike and it comes back down and then we planted right into those. So mm -hmm. Emma has lots of tomatoes. She's got um, hot peppers. She's got heat-free jalapeno peppers this year too, oh, again. Neat. I guess we so, should have had Emma here. Why do we have mm -hmm. Steve here? Yeah, no. that's it. <laughs> So, I actually have done that as well. But uh, what I want to know with your straw bales is how much do they cost in Toronto now? Because that's a big city. Oh, yeah. Well, so what I did is uh, it's even difficult to find straw bales at a garden center. Mm -hmm. And so I found a farmer who will deliver them. And wow. so I had 30 bales delivered. Um, the price per bale actually isn't bad. I don't remember what I paid. But when you tack on the delivery, it was over $10 a bale. But however, for making a garden out of nothing, um, here on Vancouver cheaper. Island, it's $10 and you drive there and pick it up. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so. they used to be $5. And I thought $5, four bales, mm -hmm. you know, you can do the four bale system where you have four, like making a little square and filled out with soil, yeah. or you can just individually line your bales up, which is what Stephen did. So but I guess at 10 bucks a bale, I drew, I drew the line. I said, that's just straw bales i guess as you're doing your math to see if it's worthwhile for you mm -hmm. the straw bale is both your growing medium and your container so mm -hmm. it's the two things so that's worth considering as you think about it and of mm -hmm. course toronto you get a lot of rain in the summer or not usually we get a fair bit yeah mm -hmm. so when i tried that on our pavement in calgary it was too dry i mean you already have the heat on the asphalt and the bales were dry just dried out just mm -hmm. didn't work out so you had to be constantly watering it and we just didn't uh, we just didn't do that. So you're doing better with okay. than I was, I think, with that. It's cheaper in Toronto. It's shockingly, eh? Because mm -hmm. for us, the bales come, now that I'm on Vancouver Island, the bales come in from, from the prairies. Oh. So they have to be shipped yep. as well. Yep. And that's why they cost so much here. Yeah. So for you, maybe it's not the best yeah. choice. Yeah. yeah. So it's good. It's a fun thing to try. Yeah. It looks like we just had a cloud come overhead. The light has faded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So what else do you want to tell me about the straw bales? Is it a success so far? So it's a success. Things are growing really well. And um, the key thing is you do have to remember to feed in the straw bales because there's there's no food in the straw bale. Right. And as that straw breaks down and all the microbial activity, they can temporarily tie up some of your nutrients. So, right. so we gave it a, a big blast of blood meal, which is high in nitrogen to get it decomposing. That was before we planted. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we put on a granulated chicken manure product afterwards to feed them. So they're looking good. Everything's looking good. No weird deficiency symptoms. No, no, they look good. I was just showing Steve today my, um, you're going to have to move in closer, Steve. Yeah. It's yeah. Like you're, you're in the dark. It's back. dark on my side. I of the know, camera. I know. <laughs> I think um, maybe I can turn the camera. Oh, it won't help. I was going to say, I was showing you earlier my Kaha pots, which are mm -hmm. a self watering version, and they actually came with their own fertilizer and it was supposed to be an organic fertilizer and it was supposed to be enough okay. for the whole season but as i showed you today i had all of that blossom end rot on my tomatoes so sometimes mm -hmm. even when a system comes with all the fertilizer it's not always enough so you have to play it by ear so let us know if you're watching now what you have been um what you've been trying this year i see we've just heard from sean that Kijiji sellers have straw bales here. I didn't get a chance to try bale gardening this summer. This is very interesting. I really love uh, Sean. She's always got a comment mm. every week. Uh, what are you? What about using worm castings uh, for fertilizer straw bales? Have you done that, Steve? Thanks for the question, Sean. No, I've not used worm castings on the straw bales, um, but it, it would be worth trying. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they're kind of a. They're like a one, 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 like they don't have a high um, mm -hmm. fertilizer count. But when I did it, I used uh, just commercial organic fertilizer. And again, didn't check the numbers too carefully, but things did grow really well for me. But I did the other system where I did the four bales square and planted in the middle. Okay. With soil, so there are those two systems. That I've seen you bring up a good point because when I talk to people about straw bale gardening, a lot of them can't visualize what you do. Mm -hmm. And so the bales are 
you can lay them on their side or, or flat down with the twine over the top. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But when it's time to plant, when you've got that decomposition going, I just tease apart the straw. Mm -hmm. And if it's really tight, you can do something like get a, a drywall saw and just cut out a little cavity. Oh, and you just plonk your, your transplant right in there, soil ball and all. So people feel weird about that. They think maybe they need to put a mat of soil on top or put soil in the bale, but you don't. Okay. And if you're interested in reading more, Emma and I, we have a radio show together, my daughter and I, okay. called The Garage Gardeners, and you'll find it on my website. But we interviewed on one show Craig LeHoulier, who's the author of a book on straw bale gardening. And he was a great guest, gave us lots of good information. So, uh, Sean, if you want to find out more, that uh, episode is on the website in the archived episodes. And uh, Craig is just packed with really good tips, so it's worth listening to. Well, you know, I honestly don't know what's happening here, where I can write a, a response to Sean. I was going to try to tell her that something, but something's not working here. Huh. And again, yet again, we don't have Ian. Ian's my technical guy. He's usually here helping us, but he's been really busy this week. He's doing a lot of video for a lot of different things and doing a lot of my video. People have been whining. We haven't had as many uh, little jobs in the garden coming up. So Ian's working on that. So mm. we can't uh, we can't complain, but I don't know. Uh, what has happened to my reply section? So we'll get back to it. Well, there it says right here reply. And then I think I can type something in. Um, yeah, so her question was can you use and straw bale? Can you use worm castings? I think the answer is yes, worm castings are just fine. Yeah, and so yes, they're fine. The thing you'd want to watch for, Sean, is if you see any um, nitrogen deficiency, there's a chance there might not be high enough nitrogen in them to totally satisfy the plants needs and and if that's the case then use something like a blood meal to to get more nitrogen in there okay and i like blood meal too because when it's cold it breaks down and it's available if mm -hmm. you use other things like seed meal it has to be broken down by the microorganisms so i think that's mm. really cool yeah okay. so that is that now i want to talk a little bit about our book sure because it's been a canadian bestseller so if mm -hmm. you haven't seen no gut vegetable gardening this is something i don't know if you can see it on the screen i can't quite see it there we go Steve on one side. Hey, you're on the right side. Look at that. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we that was back in the day when I wore glasses. Look at that. 2011. Yeah, so <laughs> we had so much fun with this. And if you haven't seen it, I'm going to try to flip through it here. I don't know how that's going to work out. Blah, blah, blah. We're working out. The illustrations mm -hmm. are funny. There was just the kooky melons going by. This is like riding a bicycle. You'd think I would be able to do it, but I can't. Okay, I love this. Do you remember when we talked about how it breaks your heart to transplant because you mm. always have to throw something out? And Mariko illustrated it using this little this little guy here with crying. It breaks your heart. Mm. Anyway, and I love the school bus. You actually feel like you've missed the bus if you um, if you do things too late. So she drew in this little school bus mm -hmm. with the little kids running for the bus. Anyway, love this book, No Gut yeah. Vegetable Gardening. I was I... just giving a talk a couple of weeks ago, and people are still buying it because it's still a classic, really, it is. Well, I think we do things the same way still, is try to have fun. Mm -hmm. Be mm -hmm. a bit silly, be a little bit irreverent, right? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of our friends really love the he said, she said. Mm -hmm. Because in the he said, he said, she said... Um, I say something like, oh, Steve, that would never work. Like I just said about the straw bells and Steve's mm -hmm. like, no, no, that's a good idea. So we do it. And sometimes your friends. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not one right way to garden. That was the message that we really hope to share. Yeah. So you have yeah. to pick what works for you in your garden. And anyways, that was really fun. Was there one particular thing in here that you want to share today, Steve? Soils or crops that you really like like fall work maybe because we're into september now is there anything that you are particularly mm. doing in the fall are you the kind of person that brings in manure in the fall for instance i know you did no, here no you know um someone recently said to me that in that book and i'd forgotten he said my favorite part was when you were talking about turnips and um and one of us had made the comment you know why bother and yeah. i still feel that way about turnips today <laughs> <laughs> but in the fall, the work I've been doing is I've been, of course, still picking the cold crops like broccoli. Mm -hmm. And I just seeded in my little greenhouse. I always brag about the greenhouse because Steve doesn't have a greenhouse. I seeded in my little greenhouse spinach and bok choy. 
because it's getting to be that kind of time of year, no matter where you are in Canada, you can still be seeding. And I know I had learned this from a guy in Edmonton, mm -hmm. Travis. He has a market garden in Edmonton, and he seeds his spinach in Edmonton in the fall, so right now, and then he harvests it in the spring. So he is the first one in Edmonton at the farmer's market. And this is growing mm -hmm. outside. Travis is growing outside. I grow in my greenhouse. And I have started some spinach already and some bok choy to be planting out. I was showing you my peas, but they're not very impressive. Mm -hmm. And I've been picking radishes quite a bit because I seeded radishes in September. So I think at this time of year, people are starting to think, well, is that it? Now we're just harvesting. It's just winding down. Mm -hmm. But I actually think uh, yeah, you if can, you're on it, you can still do things. What you do you do with your seeding. straw bale gardens this time of year? The straw bale gardens, well, this is the first year. But my intent is that after we have that first frost and they're done, that whole straw bale garden will go on to my front garden as a mulch. Yeah. Make That's a beautiful I mean. mulch. And it makes a fantastic mulch for, you know, if you're growing in root pouches too, or, mm -hmm. or grow bags, because it really lightens up the soil. Or if I have extras, I just toss it into the uh, compost, and I really like how that mm -hmm. loosens it up it too. It composts down nicely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got um, a neighbor that has a Christmas crush every year, and he brings over three bales, and I just use them up around the garden. Mm -hmm. Now we have a question here from Margo. Hi, Donna. We are gardening in carbon. Oh, carbon. Oh, I know Margo. She's written mm -hmm. in before. We have several squash, Hubbard corn, acorn, delicata. Oh, you're a, you're a fan of delicata. You love delicata squash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And pumpkin. They are close to mature, but not quite ready with threat of frost, rainy weather, daytime temperatures in the mid-teens. Is it better to pick them now or better to leave them out and cover them at night with tarps? Which has the best chance to mature and store well? Hmm. What would you do? You know, I would carbon. It can be quite nice in carbon, but kind of after mid, um, it's really after mid-September, all of a sudden it can turn around and you can get really nice weather. I think cover it. I would hedge my bets. I really like the Agribon and you can get the heavy weight. That's the floating row cover. You can get the heavy weight Agribon. And I ordered mine online because I found everybody was just selling those little three foot rows, which don't do anything. You need the big eight foot rows. And I think Margo, I might do that. I might, or, or maybe knowing me, I would half of it, I would cover with fleece and half of it I would pick because what I found was a couple of years ago, I gave my neighbors, these are winter, mostly winter squash that you're talking about, like the Hubbard and the acorn and the delicata are mostly winter squash. And I gave them a couple of my really prize, um, butternut squash and they didn't properly treat them to go into winter and so they rotted in the mm. garage. So if you're growing winter squash and that's what Margo is mainly writing about here, they need to be sort cured. of heat cured. Yeah. Right. Do you do that as well, Steve? Yeah. yeah. And so that was the she said. Now I'll give you the he said. Okay. If you were me and, and it's just a frost, not a freeze, but if it's a frost but covering it's around. raining during the days and cool temperatures during mm. the day too. Combination. Yeah, combination. Personally, I would I would leave it. Yeah, yeah. Let it cool. But if you think that you're going to look at the long range forecast, I guess that's the best you can do because if it's going to be cold for a couple of weeks, you're not going to get that curing. Those winter squash need to be cured. And what I do to cure mine is I pick them and put them in the greenhouse. And okay. I have shelves that are yeah, empty right perfect. now. Mm -hmm. And in the spring, I have you know trays full of things. But this time of year, there's nothing on those on those shelves. So I pick my squash when it starts to get rainy because what I don't want, I don't want to have a bunch of uh, mushy squash later on mm. in the winter. I want to make sure that they're cured properly. So I don't think Margot has a greenhouse, but I think that she's um, there might be a spot like a shed or something that's warmer somewhere in in the light that you can actually. Um, uh, just put them somewhere where they're going to get hot because they okay. do need that heat. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Um, I did bring in something I'm growing. Let's see. In case you're interested. Mm -hmm. I noticed Steve hasn't asked me if I'm doing anything new. Yeah, what are you doing new? <laughs> see how we give each other such a hard time? I have been growing these lovely, I know they look like weeds. They look like field weeds right now. These are... Um, sesame seeds. I'm going to hold them up closer to the camera. And you can see the little pods. And the little pods. Here, why don't I open one up? Okay. Use my reach. Yeah. We'll take one of these 
and they're sweet still pods. green. So I've been, I've been, I once grew quinoa. Have you ever grown quinoa, Steve? Just once. Okay, and I treated too. it as an ornamental. I uh, grew quinoa once. I left it out in the garden. And what happened was that it started to sprout oh, in the flower pots. Oh, really? <laughs> that was terrible. So what I read online about sesame is that you're supposed to wait until the leaves die. You can see the leaves are dying here and they're starting to turn yellow. And when they die and start to turn yellow, but that, sorry, this is very hard to hold still. When they die and start to turn yellow, what it means is that you have, um, oops, I can't see my other finger. Okay, Anyways, when they start to turn yellow, that means you can start Here thinking about it. we are. About... If you wanted to see some of these sesame yeah, seeds, you... and, there's the, little and pod. there's the pod. So if you pick them early enough at this stage where they're starting to turn yellow, where the leaves are starting to fade back, then they're supposed to cure. Now they're supposed to be in the ground for 120 days and I have not had 120 days and mine are already, but re keep in mind mine are on the south side of the greenhouse, outside, but they've got all mm. that extra heat against yeah. the greenhouse. So I think that that really helped. It's really the hottest spot in my garden, facing south against the greenhouse, mm -hmm. all that extra light reflected. So I'm excited about that. That's mm. my new crop for the year. That's what I'm doing. That's brand new for me this year. Mm. That's good. Now, I was growing a few new types of broccoli as well, because broccoli, um, usually you grow the big heads. Mm -hmm. Do you grow the big heads or the little? Yeah. Yeah. I usually grow the big heads, but this year I, I selected all kinds. And this year, I, the one I really liked was the Happy Rich Mini Broccoli. Is that like a sprouting broccoli? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. But the sprouting broccolis are usually tiny and skinny. And these ones are quite substantial. They're a couple inches across. I think that's why it's called the happy rich. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just guessing. But it's been really nice all summer. We've been having uh, continuous broccoli all summer. So I really, really like that. And I really like that one. And the other thing I've been growing this year is watermelons. People that were watching my mm -hmm. Facebook Live know that I lost quite a few to deer earlier in the season but uh, <laughs> i covered them again with that fleece agribon and the deer were discouraged and they went away and now we've harvested 10 watermelons so fantastic very excited yeah mm -hmm. i know your kids really like them we my have... kids love melons so yeah. and we ate some last night they were delicious yeah. donna's melons so. um, we tried growing watermelons my little boy keaton wanted a melon house so we built a structure out of uh, bamboo oh and oh, um, we had it all set to go but we've lost a lot to squirrels this year oh. digging squirrels digging up the young plants they so take the plants right out yeah so we oh. need to try again next year and i think what i'll do next year is pre-grow the plants i was direct seeding with keaton yeah and next year we'll pre-grow the plants and we'll actually plant them under some kind of wire protection to get them started yeah. once they're started they're fine yeah it's just protecting those little delicate seedlings yeah and of course i always start things first in my greenhouse because i just don't um i don't know what to do mm -hmm. if i start them if i start them out there i have to keep going out and watching and there's so many bugs in the soil and things that might potentially eat them so i i don't trust it i start everything in the greenhouse even the spinach that i'm starting now yes it would probably go, grow outside and I've got some just to hedge my bets outside, but I've got some in the greenhouse as well on little flats okay. so that I can transplant mm -hmm. it because otherwise, I don't know. I don't trust it. I don't trust myself. I mean, I can walk away and forget about it for a month or whatever and go, oh, no, what happened to that? So we'll, uh, we won't uh, leave it up to chance this time. Okay. So new crops, are you growing anything new yourself or is it all up to Emma now? Um, no, I'm sticking with some of the same crops. So um, for people who don't know me, figs are a big thing for me. I have lots of fig trees. We have some lemons. Um, oh, relatively new is a yuzu bush, which is a citrus much prized for its juice in, in Japan. Okay. And so we have some unripe yuzu fruit at the moment, but I'm excited about that. Uh, and new for my kids is a ponderosa lemon, which is a, it's a, you know, it's a great big lemon, not a juicy nice. thing at all, but it's a lot of fun. If you're trying to get young people excited about gardening, what could be more fun than a lemon that yeah. size? And you must in Toronto take your lemons indoors in the winter. Yes. The mm -hmm. lemons go into the uh, garage, which stays right around the freezing mark. Or I have a cold greenhouse now where, where they go. That is going to surprise a lot of people that lemons can freeze. I don't mm -hmm. think I knew that before we met Bob. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've been posting, Steve and I met uh, down in Saanich. 
well, not recently. I mean, we didn't meet originally down in Saanich, but just a couple of days ago, we went down to Saanich and we met at Bob's at Fruit Trees and More. And Bob, if you don't know him, has been growing lemons for 20 years. So he's really in really the ground here in, in Canada. Ground. Now, not to say that you can do that across Canada. He's got a special no. microclimate. But yeah. here on Vancouver Island, in, in Bob's part of Vancouver Island, you can grow lemons in the ground. So he's been doing this for 20 years. So he is the person that's sort of the groundbreaker on, on growing lemons in Canada. But he was saying to us, to Steve and, and me, that both um, lemons and limes, and I guess the yuzu as well, mm -hmm. can easily go down to minus three and you don't lose the lemons, they don't die. Below minus three, the lemons will freeze, they'll get that drying out. But the actual trees can go down to minus seven or minus eight. So he just tents them with the um fabric that we've been talking about we should almost be fabric mm -hmm. salesmen we're yeah third time on the same show but he was um he tends it with that and he puts on christmas lights and i do the same thing here now and it's really quite fun so he's done mm -hmm. that for 20 years and now he's experimenting more with figs and what did he say he had 150 kinds yeah yeah so there's a lot of kinds of figs figs that uh figs that wasn't quite right <laughs> 150 different kinds of figs that grow so i think that's really neat Oh, and Chelsea's joined us. Hey, Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea knows you too, doesn't You've met mm -hmm. Chelsea, I think. She says, roses that bud but don't bloom. What is this and what can be done? You know what? That is a really common problem. That is, um, they often call them blind roses if they... Oh, if that's they, new to If me. they get the buds. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's fusarium, which is a type of... Um, is it like a type of fungus? Hmm. and it gets on them and so the the buds will form perfect but they just don't open up so if they're sort of brown on the edges and not opening up uh that is probably fusarium if it's just not turning brown but just not opening that's probably just blind and i don't know if anyone knows what that is but maybe our friend joan would know that i don't know i have hmm. a friend that's a rose specialist so okay. yeah so but honestly chelsea just have a look and see um just sent two pics as well so we can see if we can comment on the changing foliage oh by email i don't know how to check email well uh, we'll go back that is the great thing i just have to mention this about facebook live is that we can continue to add questions and add photos right here on the facebook live even after it's over Good. and we can share it with our friends and you can mm -hmm. share it yourselves and so she sent a couple pics but i'm suspecting i guess i could go over and check email i've actually never done that Never checked email while I'm on Facebook Live. Ooh. Oh, yeah, questionable foliage. So I see that she sent some pictures and the foliage is turning red. And that sort of patchy red, yellow is seasonal. And that happens on a lot of plants. And that's when the evening temperatures start to get cold, but it's still hot during the day. And they can't properly move the nutrients up. Bob was talking about that too. Remember he said it was probably a zinc and a manganese deficiency when the leaves go funny like that on his orange and lemon trees. When it's just yellowing at the tips, that's a magnesium deficiency. But when you're getting that mottled look, it could be manganese and zinc. And he just sprays right on the plants, but I think it's too late. She, Calgary, Chelsea's writing from Calgary and in Calgary, uh, I would say it's too late. To bring yeah well personally this time of year in in toronto you know, i I, um, I tend not to treat anything a lot of people uh get worried about powdery mildew especially on the squash family melons mm -hmm. but at this time of year i just let it be there's there's no point uh, the yeah. plant is nearly done for the year yeah so just consider it early fall color chelsea sorry that sounds like a bad answer now that we said it that way but honestly um i think that what you've got in those roses is just some some trouble with um just some trouble with the, I think, nutrients. And I think that a lot of that's weather related. So I wouldn't uh, wouldn't worry about that too much. Okay, well, I don't have anything else to add about flowers. Do you want to tell people how they can get a hold of you if they want to? Sure, connect? yeah. Um, come visit me, stephenbiggs.ca. And okay. my daughter, Emma, who's 13 and I, we have a fun radio show once a month, The Garage Gardeners. And it's all about extending the season and pushing zone boundaries so we've talked to somebody from uh, yukon we've um, spoken uh, to a fig expert this uh, most recent episode who's growing 180 types of figs in new jersey and next month we are talking to somebody about 
kids in gardening and, and we're stretching our specialty a little bit, but we want to extend the age zone boundaries and get more young people gardening. I think that's we're pretty really excited exciting. about that. So mm -hmm. come visit me, stephenbiggs.ca, and you can see the radio show. And I have a Biggs on Figs blog. If anybody's interested in growing figs, I write all about it there. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, Thanks Stephen. for having me. All right. It was a lot of fun. And sorry, I had some technical problems. I could not figure out um, some of the little things, although I see we just have another question here from Sean. She asks about the powdery mildew spores in the ground. Will just cleaning the debris on the ground be enough? Is that what you do, just remove all the plants? Yeah, I clean up uh, all of the... Uh the dead the plants and compost them at the end of the year yeah but yeah so, powdery mildew is always there so um, if you get powdery mildew on your squash don't take it as a sign of you not growing something right and those plants are very susceptible and it'll happen every year mm. I do take it as a sign that because we like to argue I do take it as a sign that you're short on zinc so the, the ratio between the zinc and the phosphorus is wrong and so I've actually and this happened actually it was someone not a nurse i know your wife's a nurse it was somebody else that said to me i had a cold and they said you're probably short on zinc when our bodies are short on zinc we get colds we just get run down and somebody else mentioned to me that they had noticed this on vegetables as well and so when i looked it up i was able to find zinc at the drugstore just zinc sulfate mixed it with water a tablespoon of zinc in a gallon of water sprayed on my plants not now once you've actually got the powdery mildew but about a month before when you see the edges just turning brown sean you'll know that you're getting it and that's the time to spray it on because there might be something missing in your soil and it's worth a try it's cheap it's easy to try so that's an easy one well we got to run we've already used our 30 minutes so thanks again steve thanks Tom. all right and thanks for joining us and just smile sweetly at the camera while i shut us down <laughs> Ha <laughs>